Hello and welcome to the first episode of the Conflict Skills Podcast. I'm your host, Simon Good. I'm a professional mediator and trainer in conflict resolution skills. In this podcast, we help you develop the tools and frameworks to deal with conflict strategically, to respond rather than react. And in this first episode today, I thought I might talk about the different kinds of conflict. Some people don't realize that there are pretty distinct, actually, types of conflict, or at least factors that can contribute to the conflict. And each of the different types of conflict needs a different type of response, which means that if we're not sure about the kind of conflict that we're dealing with, it can be really difficult to know then, well, what's the best starting point in terms of you know, possible options for responding So it's very helpful because once we can get clear on the factors that are driving the conflict, we can analyse the situation and then develop options and respond strategically. And in a lot of cases, we might be dealing with, a, I guess, a mixed situation where there are a few different types of conflict involved. And that's also actually quite a good spot to be because we can then almost systematically go through the different drivers or factors that are contributing to the conflict and deal with each of them in turn, which often means that the resolution that we can come to is much more effective or longer lasting than a quick band-aid fix that we might put on a situation but doesn't lead to any long-term change. So the five different kinds of conflict are data, it's the first one, interest, the second kind of conflict, values is the third kind of conflict, structural or structure is the fourth type of conflict, and then relationship is the fifth possible kind. Now, relationship conflict we're all familiar with. It's the kind of day four, day five moment when you've had maybe family or friends come and stay at your house for a little while. And at the beginning, for the first couple of days, everything is awesome. It's The jokes are funny. You know, it's really nice to see each other again. <coughs> but usually by about day four or five is the time when, you know, you just start to get under each other's skin. It's difficult sharing a space with people, even your friends or family, which means that if they don't put their plate on the in the dishwasher and leave it for you to clean up for whatever reason, it starts to become very irritating. Relationship conflicts that I see when I'm doing mediation are things like people who refuse to speak to each other or they just, the tone of voice or the facial expression or the body language starts to affect the other person. They make assumptions and draw conclusions about the other person's intention. These are all sort of types of relationship conflict. Now, some people think that relationship conflict is what's going on in all situations, but actually often relationship conflict can come up as a symptom of the other four different kinds. So in terms of responding to relationship conflict, we could have a future-focused conversation, maybe talk to the person and say, look, it feels like things have been a bit tense lately. Um, I just wanted to clear the air and maybe... Um, look for options about how we can relate differently that would be helpful for you and and for me as well. Or, you know, I feel like things have been off track or we've crossed wires a little bit recently. You know, I'd love it if we could find a way to reset um, and then maybe figure out a way to do things differently moving forward. And if you're stuck for ideas, the best way to deal with relationship conflict often is the opposite of the thing that caused it. If you've been spending too much time together, then look for some time apart. If you haven't seen someone for a long time and you miss reading emails because there's no tone of voice and body language, etc., maybe organise a time to meet in person or have lunch or whatever it might be, depending on the situation that you're dealing with. But we would do those things typically after dealing with the other kinds of conflict. We'd leave relationship conflict until last, which is why it's number five. So let's go back then to number one. The first possible type of conflict is data. It's working from different sets of information, different expectations, different access to the same information, different understandings about what was said or agreed to. You know, maybe the starting point with conflict with your child who's not cleaning their room is explaining to them what's expected. Maybe that's never something that you've actually communicated. How long can they leave their room messy before... 
your mum or dad will have a meltdown. Um, how much help they should expect from you during that process is another example. I know with my son, if I say clean up, he's like, can you help? And actually, in hindsight, I've never said it's your room, it's your responsibility. Actually, this is something you should do. I usually just react and get frustrated and say, it's your mess, mate. You know, why should I clean it up for you? With business to business relationships, it might be things like who's agreed to what, the contracts that are in place. Some sections might be ambiguous. It's possible that they think you've agreed to do something that you haven't. It's possible that you're expecting them to do something that they hadn't realized. When we're dealing with discrepancies around data conflict, usually the best starting point is to get clear on the data. If you're in a situation and it feels like your boss is micromanaging you, a data conflict contributor here might be the fact that you've got different ideas about the relationship you should have with your manager, what's appropriate monitoring and what's overstepping the mark. So in that case, the starting point would be to say, look, could we organize a time to get on the same page about you know, some of the projects I'm working on and how you give me feedback, what information you need in terms of keeping you up to date and then where I have autonomy to make my own decisions without coming and checking on you. So if we're dealing with data conflict, the best way to deal with it's getting clear on the data. You need to sometimes do that a little bit respectfully, especially when the other person's wrong. You almost need them to give an op- uh, you need to give them an opportunity to admit that they're wrong, change their mind, you know, compromise without losing too much face. So maybe saying something like, look, I know how long and detailed these contracts can be. And especially in the midst of things as chaotic as they are right now, it's not always easy to be able to go through each detail with a fine tooth comb. I've just looked at the contract and that is actually something that you've agreed to. So that's something that we will be needing moving forward. But if you've got any questions or you've got a different take on the situation, please let me know. Basically saying you've you have to do it, mate. It's in the contract. You can sort of see how there's these two different ways of broaching the issue or going about the same conversation it might be received very differently, to say the least. So that's data conflict. The next, next possible kind of conflict is interest conflict. A conflict of interests inherently in your interest versus theirs. What you want and what they want can't both be achieved. <laughs> what you need and what they need are two very different things. Sometimes you'll be able to find a way to meet both of your interests, that win-win that a lot of conflict resolution trainers talk about. It's very rare in reality that this can actually happen though. So often when we're dealing with interest conflict, it's about naming both sides, you and theirs, your needs and their needs, your interests and their interests, and then setting up a future and solution-focused conversation by asking questions like, what do you think would help? How can we figure this out? What do you think would work moving forward? So the classic example would be within an organisation, maybe a manager of a section leaves, they win the lotto and they're on a desert island somewhere, and two people who didn't win the lotto and they're not sitting on a desert island both want to apply for that job. It's, you know, a promotion, it's more money, it's more seniority, whatever reason that is appealing. I'm, you can probably tell I'm not really in a frame of mind these days where I want to apply for any promotions ever again, but for a lot of people it's important. So they both want to apply for this promotion and of course it would make sense that there's an increased chance of them getting into conflict because they both want that same thing and they're going to be effectively competing for it. So you would maybe organize a way to address this. If you're the senior manager, you know, who's above the person who's won the lotto, you might meet with the two junior people and say, look, you know, as you're aware, um, Jill's on an island somewhere. We wish her all the best. Um, in the meantime, I just wanted to talk about that position that's now vacant. Look, that'll be advertised. I don't know if either of you have given some thought to applying for it. You know, I encourage you to. I think you'd both be good candidates. That's a decision that I'll need to make down the track. But in the meantime, I just wanted to talk with the two of you to maybe think through what you might need to focus on so that this doesn't cause any problems in your working relationship. What would you need to keep in mind? What do you need from one another? So this doesn't cause things to get stuck because the last thing that we want is for things to go backwards and for us all to have another issue to deal with while we're all quite busy covering for you know, Jill who's on the island. So name the situation and then say, what do you think is needed? What do you think would help? 
for me, when I'm talking to a client who wants to organize training, they call and say, hi, Simon, we want training in managing difficult conversations or something. And I'll say, no worries, this is the cost. Sometimes they'll say, can we have a discount? It's because they've got a particular budget that they're working with or they're a not-for-profit or something. And if I were to take this interest approach, I might say something like, look, I know on your end it's difficult to make tight budgets work. I've been in manager myself in a few different not-for-profits and I know how hard it can be. Um, actually, we set our prices with the costs that are involved in mind, including things like maintaining our finances and organisational status, insurances, qualifications of the trainer. And for you looking for someone to provide you training, you want someone with all those things because it means that you know if anything goes wrong, our insurance will cover you, for example. We can't do that if we continue to reduce the price below the, pro the point that we've set. So unfortunately, no, in this case, we're not able to offer a discount. It's sort of outlining your position as well as theirs. I understand the reason why you're asking for a lower price. You're not being a jerk. It makes sense. You're trying to do the best you can with the budget that's available. And here is my position. So we would deal with interest conflict in this way of naming it and then asking, what do you think would help? How can we figure this out? And coming up with a bit of a plan. And values conflict in some ways is quite similar. Values conflict might be things like religious worldview or a very deep fundamental value that you hold. Maybe someone on the leadership team really values environmental sustainability, so they want to choose a provider that's a bit more expensive, but it's a greener option. And someone else on the leadership team thinks that you should focus on cutting costs because it will mean that your programs can help more people. I mean, they're both ethically positive views, but you might not be able to achieve both of them. And again, we might just name that difference and say, look, it seems like we've got different priorities from where we're sitting. Does that make sense given our different background and perspectives and you know, career up until this point? At the same time, we're not going to be able to do both of these. So can we organise the time to go through some options together and see if we can find something that we're both okay with? We name that difference respectfully in a neutral and mutual way and then basically say, well, how are we going to figure this out? Again, if you're a manager and you're supporting two other people who are in this situation, you would facilitate that same process. Um, Dave, it seems like you're a very um, straight shooter. You call it how you see it. We always know where we stand with you because you tell us straight away, Dave, I, I think that has a lot of strengths. I'm looking at um, Carmela, who's a different member of the team, who has a different way of working. Carmela, it seems like you like to give things a bit of thought before you speak. Maybe you spend some time mulling over options or doing some research before putting forward your perspective. And that's incredibly helpful as well because it means that we have that real detail orientation. We can set ourselves up for success by overcoming and identifying potential problems, right? So... I mean, having the two of you on the team is a real benefit. At the same time, I have noticed in the past that sometimes these different communication styles, different ways of working have meant that you know, it's possible that one or two of you are frustrated and at least I want to find a way to run our meetings together and to communicate as a team so that everyone's needs are being met. What do you think would work? So we name that and then just say, well, how are we going to figure this out? So that's interests and values. The next possible kind of conflict that you might come up against is structural conflict. This is where structures themselves might be contributing to a situation. If emails are getting heated back and forth between you and a client, maybe pick up the phone and give them a call or organize a time to meet face to face. If your boss is hassling you for updates and they're interrupting you and doing it more frequently than you'd like, Maybe talk to them about setting up a standing, you know, weekly or fortnightly meeting where you can go through the projects that you're working on and give them an update. Um, clarifying when you're available to answer work emails after hours and when you're not. What's an expected time to arrive at the office? Should you, like, who's in the meeting? Maybe just removing a few of the people that are in these regular meetings where things are going pear-shaped might mean that you actually solve that problem just by having the right mix of people in the room. So we would think about structural options to respond to structural causes of conflict. 
And then again, finally, that final one might be relationship. And you'll see that come up as symptoms of these other underlying factors. So there's five types again, data conflict, interest conflict, values conflict, structural conflict and relationship conflict do all have very different causes and I hope that it's been helpful for you listening to me unpack some of those different types and you might be starting to think about well different situations you've dealt with in the past or that you're dealing with at the moment involving conflict maybe thinking using this different lens about what could be going on and then what does it mean for you then in terms of options for responding Thank you so much for listening. I really hope that you subscribe and stick with us for future episodes. I look forward to getting to know each other as we move forward with the progression of the podcast. Have a great day. Bye for now.